Okay, we're recording. Thank you. I'm gonna see if anyone joins us before I form Hello, everybody. Hi, Chris. Before I... Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? I can't hear you. Why can't I hear you? You might be on mute, maybe. Maybe I should go out and come back in again. Or your headphones? I can oh, hear I'm gonna I unplug my you. earphones and she, go She out can't and hear us. Again. So Nate, maybe like tell her to check her mute settings. Yeah, I'll text her. I'm not, I'm at home. <laughs> oh, you can't just walk to the next room. Okay. <laughs> while that while that happens, um, I'm gonna start the meeting. Um, it is 4.31 on September 29th, 2022, and seeing a presence of a quorum, I'm calling this Community Resources Committee meeting of the Town Council to order. Um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 22 of the Acts of 22 and by chapter 107 of the Acts of 22. This meeting will be conducted by remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public is permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. At this time, I'm going to call the role of those members present um, to make sure that they can hear everyone and everyone can hear them. We're going to start with, I guess I'm the first one in alphabetical order today. Mandy is present. Um, Pam. Present. And Jennifer. Present. Pat and Shalini will not be joining us today. Um, with that, we're going to go right into our agenda. Um, and the first item on the agenda is, uh, the, oh, Pam? Yes, I have a technical question. Sure. Um, I'm on a Mac, a borrowed Mac. Is there a way to increase the sound um, coming from the computer itself? So usually on a Mac, the um, up on like what would be the function keys, like F 10, F11, F11? There might be a volume button and you might have to hold like the Apple key and then hit that volume up, but. Did so that turn work? Turn it off. Try yes, the other one. The upper, there's the what button to turn it off. Okay. And then there gets to be the volume. Okay, I got it. Okay. Are you good, Pam? Excellent. So. It is now 4.32 and at 4.32, I don't know whether I always have to do the times, but at 4.32 PM, we are reopening the continued hearing on zoning bylaw article two, zoning districts, article three, use regulations and article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay districts. It has been continued from May 26, 2022 and September 8th, 2022. And this hearing, is to see if the town will vote to add Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district to the zoning bylaw, amend Article 2 zoning districts to add FEMA floodplain overlay district, and amend related sections of Article 3 use regulations to regulate activities in the 100-year floodplain, as shown on the flood insurance rate maps issued by FEMA. For the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program, firm maps indicate areas that have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The purpose of the floodplain management regulations is to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare and to minimize the harmful impacts of flooding upon the community. And um, this is our third hearing on this. And I'm going to go to Chris or Nate for an update on whether we can potentially proceed to close this hearing or need to continue it. I can speak to that. Um, I did speak to um, our contact at AECOM, our consultant. And um, there was some sort of glitch or delay in FEMA's review of the final um, maps. They are currently under that final review. And um, when I spoke to this fellow or emailed him a few, maybe it was last week, he said, um, within a few weeks, we will be getting the maps. So I'm very hopeful that we will be getting them within a few weeks. I have to apologize for all these delays. I just don't understand if it's COVID or what it is, but it's really not, it's not good, but we will get there in the end. So I would recommend that you continue this hearing to sometime in November. Oh. I'm, just, I'm just gonna jump in quickly. Hi, I'm yep. Nate, um, for anyone who's watching or listening. The, um, you know, we have our letter of final determination and six months from that, we have to have our, our you know, local regulations in place, which are what Mandy mentioned, the zoning and the, the overlay. And it's unclear if FEMA will extend that, even though it's taken so long to get to this point. So, you know, I think we're in a good position where, where we are with our draft language and our bylaw. And so it may be that, you know, come November, we have to 
you know, act quickly in terms of getting it, you know, to the town council and to the process going just because um, typically we want to have the local regulations voted on a month before the actual deadline. So then we can send them to the state and FEMA for their one, you know, for their review They're, you know, they've already looked at it, the state likes it. Um, so I, I feel like we're in a good position, but we, you know, it's unclear if we'll have an extended time at, you know, because of these delays. Thank you, Jennifer, and then Chris. No, so I just, so even if FEMA is causing the delay, they'll still, they won't extend it. Wow. We could ask, we could ask. No, I'm that. not saying we should, but we'll get it done. I just, yeah, mm. Chris? stating the obvious. Yeah. I just wanted to note that we need to refer to the maps in our text. So there's a place in the text where we have to put in the name of the new maps with a date. And since we don't have those new maps yet, it, it's hard to do that. We could put in the date of our old maps and get the text accepted, but then you'd have to go back and change that and do it again. So I would say, let's wait another few weeks and see if we can make this happen. So we have CRC meetings on October 13, 27, November 3, and November 17. Which date is recommended for us to continue this till? We could try October 27th. Okay. With that recommendation, I'm going to make a motion to continue the hearing on zoning bylaw Article 2, zoning districts Article 3, use regulations, and Article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district to October 27 at 4.30 p.m. Second, Rooney. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, Mandy is an aye. Pam? Aye. And Jennifer? Aye. Okay, moving on. It is now 4.37 and we are opening the continued hearing of zoning bylaw official zoning map FEMA floodplain overlay district that has been continued from May 26, 2022 and September 8, 2022. Um, do we need a report or shall I just make the motion? <laughs> I'm going to move to continue the zoning bylaw official zoning map FEMA floodplain overlay district hearing to October 27th at 4.35 p.m. Second, Rooney. Okay, any discussion? Um, seeing none, we start with Pam. Aye. And Jennifer? Aye. And Mandy is an aye. Those are both unanimous votes. That means we will not be discussing action items 3A or 3B. <laughs> they will be moved to our October 27th meeting. Um, before we move, I'm going to switch the order of these action items um, because we have staff here now. And so, um, and Nate is here for the what has been renamed, but not on our agenda, the zoning bylaw article 14 permanent proposal. At the time I created the agenda, I wasn't exactly sure what zoning bylaw articles it would be changing, um, but it is actually not anything related. Not there, There's nothing in article 14 changing. It's article 5s, 5, 11, 12, and the classification table, which I think is article Great. three. Yeah. Um, that that has proposed amendments to it. And so since Nate is here, we're going to deal with that one first um, before we move on to the other items on our agenda. So I think Nate had a presentation for us. Sure, I can I can share my screen if that's all right. And then uh, I have a presentation and then, um, you know, as Mandy mentioned, there's there's actually four sections of the bylaw that are changing. So then I have those four sections we can walk through just to see you know, line by line, what, what it looks like. Sounds and it, it was updated in the packet. Um, you know, we made some last minute changes last week due to the planning board comments and some public comments we received on this. So the presentation has been updated a bit and the, um, some of the language changed a little bit. Uh, it was highlighted in yellow in the packet, just, you know, it was minor, but just to keep everyone up to speed. Yeah. So, 
we're calling this updating food and drink establishments in the zoning bylaw. We're reframing it. So it's really, we're not changing article 14, right? So we're not going to try to go in there and change the language in article 14 and make that permanent. So article 14 is set to expire this year you know, at the end of the year and it will. So we're not, you know, necessarily recommending that it be, um, be lengthened. So just for background, um, the food and drink um, classifications in the bylaw have been there for a while. And so even before COVID staff had talked about um, updating those classifications, those uses, um, in part because the ZBA had developed a, a kind of set of standard conditions that were always applied to, the, to those uses. And, um, you know, so we felt like, wow, we can manage this based on the permitting histories, right? 10 plus years of permitting history and enforcement, we realized we could probably reclassify and update, you know, and just update it. It wasn't necessarily, um, you know, that it was a huge problem, but we felt we could be more accurate and help with some permitting. Uh, coincidentally, with Article 14, um, you know, there was recommendations from, from the CRC town staff in the, in the Amherst business community um, to keep some aspects of Article 14, you know, that was adopted during the pandemic. So we learned that administrative approval and enforcement by staff can be done. We have the capacity and there really isn't negative impacts to, to this administrative approval process, which happens now. Um, and we're trying to formalize that with the proposed amendments. And the businesses responded positively to Article 14. So, you know, allowing outdoor dining um, through site plan review, it's not a discretionary permit. So, you know, it was, it seemed like it was just more encouraging to businesses. And so, you know, looking at kind of the purpose and goals were to have these new classifications that more closely corresponded to the uses that the food and drink establishments, um, you know, set up as in town. Um, you know, clarify and improve the permitting process, uh, encourage businesses to stay and expand. And so we see it as, you know, both helping staff to administer the bylaw and it's encouraging businesses who want to stay here or re relocate here. Um, we are changing the administrative approval process a bit to actually uh, give it a little bit more, more teeth, if you want to say it that way, so we can put conditions on through administrative approval. Uh, and, the, and the bid in the Chamber of Commerce supports this. And so through Article 14, I just, I just want to say quickly that, you know, it's been in place for a while. There's been about 40 establishments that have gone through Article 14. Um, about 18 of those are restaurants or related to restaurants or dining or food and drink establishments. And the ones that are shown here are things that have been permitted administratively through Article 14. So the spoke expanded, it actually doubled in size to this other side of the building. Garcia's opened and added outdoor dining. The Drake opened uh, and Mexicolito opened. And so these were approved administratively. And during um, using Article 14, the applicants were made to submit you know, plans, a management plan, a narrative. It wasn't as if they just had you know, a little building permit. Uh, we set up an application process. And then the inspection services through the building commissioner wrote a decision that we would keep on file with the town clerk. So it functions very much like a land use permit with the respect that you know, we have plans we can reference, uh, we have a management plan, and then we have an approval with conditions. And so it's something that you know, we have a record of, uh, which is new for Article 14. And just we like that process, and that's what we actually want to keep. Um, in terms of what we're talking about, where it applies, it's in five uh, zoning districts. So it's in the you know, downtown, the BG and the BL. It's in the village centers, um, you know, in BVC, in the commercial district and in the um, neighborhood business. Uh, really neighborhood business is just around the train tracks um, near Dickinson and Triangle Street. So, you know, BN isn't found anywhere else. So it's a really limited geographic extent uh, where this would apply. So. Food and drink establishments, we're saying, are only permitted in these areas. So everything in white, the residential zones or any other zones, they're just not allowed. And a, this is a comparison of how it's approved now and what we're proposing. And so right now, there's three classifications. There's class one, class two, and class three. And, we're, and basically, we just say it's a, you know, a class one restaurant. Um, you say it's a cafe, lunchroom, or cafeteria. It really what distinguishes that between a class two is uh, the hours of operation. So class two is open later. Um, it also serves alcohol later. And so that's a special permit for class two. Class one is site plan review, which means it's a by right use and it would be, you know, permitted through the planning board with conditions 
And then there's a class three restaurant, which to my recollection has never been used, you know, a drive up restaurant. Um, I will say for class one, we have this administrative approval, which was new. Um, if you had watched the planning board meeting on this. And so really what happens is if a, if, a, if a restaurant is proposing to go into a new space that's not a restaurant, it would go through site plan review with the planning board and it would get a set of conditions. If that restaurant then went out of business three years later and a new restaurant came in and they were proposing no changes to the exterior, so right, so it's, you know, except for signs, it would be administratively approved. And that's already been in the bylaw. So that's something that's been happening for years. So the planning board honestly does not see many restaurant applications because most restaurants will go into a restaurant space because it's very expensive to outfit a, a, you know, a, a, you know, a building or a space for, for, with a kitchen, right? I mean, you could be talking about a few hundred thousand dollars in improvements to get a kitchen, to get ventilation and to make all those improvements. So typically when a space has already been a permitted as a restaurant, it's reused as a restaurant. So then what we're proposing is to eliminate class one, class two, class three, and really we're saying we're gonna have a restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other similar establishment. And that would be through site plan review or this administrative approval, a, a bar with no food. And so that's a special permit, a nightclub, a special permit, and then establishments with over an occupant load of 250. And so really um, a bar with no food, we say no food because that's really what the, the state and local regulations, how they, how they describe that. And in our bylaw, we, we define a bar as the primary use of this, of this space is consumption of alcoholic beverages where food is incidental. And so, you know, someone on the planning board asked, well, what about Moan and Dove? They serve peanuts. And I said, well, that you, you can allow certain prepackaged or Kind of simple foods and still be a bar. You're not you're not going to become a restaurant, and that's just by code definition, um, and by the ABCC, the state's board, right? They they'll also um, review any 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 establishment that comes in and looking for a liquor license gets applies to the state. It gets referred to the Amherst Board of License Commissioners, and then it has to be permitted both through the local and state regulations, in addition to land use permits like site plan review or zoning board. So what we found is that between class one and class two. Most restaurants will, um, whether they're open late or not, the standard set of conditions can manage it effectively. And then staff can enforce something if there's a problem. So if it ends up becoming that, um, you know, when people leave or there's queuing on the sidewalk and there's a complaint, staff can follow up with the establishment and then um, can, can, you know, can manage that. Uh, there may be issues where their dumpsters are overflowing or they have, you know, they said they're going to keep trash inside, but they end up keeping it outside. and Typically, those are um, pieces that are required in the management plan, and then there's something that you know that it can be enforced, and we can either have them uh, amend their site plan or special permit, or we can you know the town through an enforcement action has them you know fix it um, according to what was permitted. Um, and so you know really class one and class two get combined into this this first one that site plan review and special per, um, and administrative approval. What's important here too is it's not a special permit, so it's not discretionary. Um, and so what happens really too, um, Rob was explaining this last week, it was interesting to hear that most restaurants will come in as a class one because it's by site plan review. They say they're going to be open till 11, you know, they're not going to stay open late. They get permitted as a class one. And then immediately they, once they get that approval and they get the space open, they just immediately turn around and apply as a class two. And, you know, they've already built out the space. They have the seating. They have the special the site plan review and the ZBA really, you know, if they meet all their conditions of the bylaw, there's really no way to deny them as a class two, right? They've already, and sometimes they might wait a few months. Sometimes it's almost like the next day, right? So they'll outfit the space, they'll do a really good job, and then they'll just turn right around because they're already in the space. They've already been permitted. And they'll say, well, I'd like to stay open now a little later and serve alcohol later. And it's you know, and so it's interesting that it's not gaming the bylaw, but that's just how it works. And so we're saying, well, why have this distinction? We can have it right here. You know, if it, and, and so right now too, with this use, um, these proposed uses, if there's a restaurant during the day and then they want to be a bar at night, they actually have to get two permits, right? So if they're going to be a restaurant during the day, it's site plan review or administrative approval. And if at nine o'clock they want to stop, close their kitchen, and then just serve mostly alcohol, alcohol, they're gonna to have to get a special permit from the ZBA. So they actually have two permits they'd have to get. So we're not necessarily making it easier to become a bar or a nightclub or 
you know, a larger establishment. So for instance, Johnny's right now, um, you know, is about 170, 180 occupant uh, load. And if they all of a sudden wanted to put on a, you know, an addition and have a huge banquet room and say, um, you know, after hours, they become a, a place with over 250, they'd have to get a special permit to, if they wanted to be open consistently and have that size establishment. Um, so yeah, here's just some examples of how, what would fit into these new categories. Um, you know, Johnny's Tavern, El Comolito, Pita Pock is in House of Teriyaki, you know, would be considered a restaurant, cafe, bar with food or other establishment. So they would be through site plan review. Um, and you can see their occupant loads. And so just to give you a sense of size, so Pita Pock is pretty small, it's 21, you know, that's employees and, um, and patrons. Typically this number would reflect both indoor and outdoor seating or space, as well as, you know, staff. Um, you know, they may, some of those, some of these numbers may not reflect out newer outdoor space, but, you know, it's just to give a rough estimate. A bar with no food is the Moan and Dove. And so we're saying that would be a special permit. A nightclub is Hazel's. I think there's only one or two in town. Um, and then a larger establishment like the Hangar, um, you know, which has almost 400 um, occupant capacity. So that's a really big space. Um, and then as we are looking at this, um, there's a ripple effect. And so if we change the use categories, what I just showed you in terms of the, you know, the proposed uses in the permitting path, that's, that's really what, that's um, a summary of table three. But then we realize it impacts article five because accessory uses are referenced as part of restaurants. Um, we want to formalize administrative approval, which is already allowed as part of site plan review, that's article 11. And then we updated some definitions in article 12. And so, although we're saying let's update food and drink establishments, it has you know, this, this impact of, uh, you know, in a few different sections of the bylaw. So I can stop there for now and, and take any questions, or if you want me to just to jump right into the, um, the language, Mandy. Um Let's do some brief questions and then we can talk about language specific. Pam. Yeah, that would be great. Um, what, is, what is actually the definition of a nightclub just for my own edification? Yeah, so there's a, a building code definition. Um, and you know we've thought about whether or not we put it in the zoning bylaw. And so um, it says it's actually, it's funny. It's kind of funny. Just, I, I think it's a, that the building code is usually really strict and they say a nightclub is somewhere where there's crowded spaces, there's loud music, there's an occupant capacity that's greater than the seating, limited food, and um, I think that's really it. And it can be open late. Low so, lighting. What's low it? lighting. And low lighting, and low lighting, yes. So- um, God forbid it should be a light, a brightly lit nightclub. <laughs> right. So for instance, you know, um, um, say a restaurant in town, say like the hangar, all of a sudden have, they have a lot of space and say, you know, in one part of their um, space, they're like, okay, we're going to remove all the seating at some point. They would, that would be considered a nightclub space then. So that would actually have, you know, trigger a new type of permit. So it would no longer be a bar. It could be a nightclub if they, you know, have like so a DJ booth. So does Bistro 63 qualify as sort of a split personality? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Got they that. Did. Um So I, I was really I was really interested to hear the the fact that that class one permittees then turn around and go to class two and the question is okay so what's so what's so much more attractive to be a class two it's because you can stay open later right right and and serve alcohol later so and serve alcohol later so when we come to the text um, I'm I want to focus on that just a little bit because I think that was that was one of the clear definitions between a class one and two was that they weren't allowed to do all that later. And so it feels like depending on where you are in town, that may or may not be a good thing. So we'll put that off to the wording conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Jennifer. Yeah, so I had a question, um, which I hadn't thought about before when we reviewed this, but on Sunset and Fearing, there's the pizza parlor. I think it's even though it's not, it's a residential, must be grandfathered in from a long time ago. So if they wanted to have outdoor seating or expand, since it's already a restaurant, it sounds like that could be done administratively. 
it, so is it possible, but that is right smack in a residential area. So what could be done about that? Yeah. So in a, you know, without, you know, looking into it, I, I would assume that that was a pre-existing use. And so it's a non-conforming use. So it actually have to get a permit through the ZBA. Okay. So any changes, whether it's interior or exterior have to go through a special permit process. So even if that pizza place leaves and a new plate pizza place wants to come in, it might actually have to go, they have to get a special permit. So, mm-hmm. you know, um, there's probably a number of instances where there's uses like that, where it's pre-existing, non-conforming, and it, then it requires a special permit anytime there's a change. Yeah. Although actually in that case, the owner lives across the street, so I don't think he'd allow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I, I'm thinking kind of like with El Carmelito, which there's a residential, mm-hmm. it's like abuts like uh, townhouse and houses. Right. So if that if they wanted to open outdoors and be later at night, what would happen with with that? Right. I guess what I'm asking is, would the abutters be notified? Yeah. So so um, this is the way staff sees it, right? So they were permitted right now to have indoor dining. If they wanted to do outdoor dining, that's a change to the site. So they'd have to go through a site plan review, and it would be you know public hearing through the planning board, and so the abutters would be notified. And so, in say they did that and it was approved, and then two years later. Um, they close and a new restaurant comes in through the land use permitting process. There's been already a site plan review and an amended site plan review for a restaurant there with outdoor dining. So if a new restaurant was to come in and use exactly what was there in terms of the space and everything, it, that could be administratively approved. It wouldn't have to go through a new site plan because it's already under a site plan review. So those conditions and everything, all those standards would apply to the new use. Um, and so you know, if the new restaurant then wanted to stay open an hour later, that might trigger site plan review. Or if they wanted to make the outdoor dining bigger or make any changes, you know, even if they cha- if they wanted to make big changes to the exterior of the building, say they wanted to, right, if there's only one entrance and they wanted to open it all up so it's sliding doors, that might be a big enough change that that's actually site plan review now too. And so the way it work, the way it's worded, it says no changes to the building or site. And so if they're making changes to the building, it triggers another another permit. So so um, the abutters are notified with site plan review. I can't remember that. They are. Yep, it's a public hearing with the planning board. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. Thank you. Um, I think we can go on to wording now, and I just want to for the attendees and and then for us. This is on the council agenda for this coming Monday for the formal referral for. Um, public hearing and recommendation to both the planning board and us. So this is sort of our preview um, so that when it comes to us the next time, we've we've at least seen a little bit and have been thinking about it instead of it being brand new. All right, Um, I'll share my screen again then. So in terms of the use table, we're proposing uh, a swap, a delete everything that's there and replace it with a new 3.352 section. And so the only thing that actually remains from the current standards and conditions and the uses is what's in yellow here. And so in the BN district, um, there's a limitation on the number of seats to 30, both indoor and outdoor. Uh, alcohol needs to stop being served at nine. And you know, from building to building, so any outside wall of the building occupied by um, the establishment shall be located more than 100 feet from any residential building in a residential district. So that means like, you know, from the out, you know, from building to building it has to be over 100 feet. And then we say walk up facilities may be permitted as an accessory use. So that standard and condition is in the bylaw now and we're proposing just to keep it, but everything else you see here is all new. So, um, um, the uh, sorry, something popped up. So, you know, here's the three, the four new categories restaurant, cafe, bar with food, bar with no food, nightclub, and a larger establishment. And we're saying that, you know, here are the zoning districts they apply in, um, site plan review for the first one, special permit for the rest. Um, what is new is, you know, through the, through the, um, I'm gonna try to make it a little bigger. Um, it would be great if you could. Increase the yeah, you know, it wasn't, it's not letting me. It, it is in the packet. So if you've got the packet, I have it. Yeah, you're right. 
It, it is uh, in the packet. Um, I'll try a little bit though. Yeah, here we are. That, that did get it a little bigger, Nate. All right. So what we, you know, what we have now too with restaurants and certain times in the bylaw, we have a set of standards and conditions that because it's in the bylaw, then we say as applicable, every applicant has to meet this. And so we're saying that as applicable, everyone needs approval by the board of licensing commissioner. They need subject, they're subject to other state and local codes and regulations. Um, and this is where we reference accessory uses, um, you know, so outdoor dining, live or pre-recorded music, or, or you know, a, a drive-through facility would be considered accessory to the restaurant or bar use. We're saying that the establishment has to operate, you know, shall operate and be maintained in accordance with plans. And so we're saying that applicants have to submit a site plan, floor plan, a layout plan with occupant capacity for indoor and outdoor dining, a patron management plan, you know, how you're going to manage patrons, um, a general management plan, which deals with everything from noise, uh, trash um, removal to snow removal to lighting, um, a parking management plan and a traffic impact statement. Um, we actually define the management plan down here. So it lists a number of things, hours of operation, outdoor dining, deliveries, noise control, um, you know, response to complaints, employee parking. And so, um, you know, when things are administratively approved, they still have to submit all these plans. And so, you know, putting this in the bylaw now requires even something that is going to an existing space to submit, plan to submit something that satisfy the satisfies this bylaw. Um, you know, if alcohol, you need electronic ID verification, um, on-site training and certifications, including cr uh, crowd control and tips. That's like for larger uses or bars, uh, reusable ta tableware for outdoor service. Um, outdoor furniture needs to be placed to meet, you know, clearances and egress requirements. And so, you know, the building commissioner and staff feels that these set of conditions provide enough information that whether it's administrative approval or through site plan review or the ZBA, we can generate conditions that are required in the permit that an applicant you know, has to meet, meet this, right? So if they, in their management plan, say for instance, that trash is gonna be stored indoors and it'll be collected daily and they put a dumpster outside, we can say, well, you didn't have a dumpster. So either you have to reapply through site plan review or a special permit, or we're, we're gonna make you remove that dumpster. You know, If you expand your outdoor dining more than you outlined on your plan, that's a change to the site plan. You'll have to comply with, you know, um, with what the enforcement action is. And so, you know, we feel like these standards and conditions, which aren't in the bylaw now, provide enough information to, to help an app, it, you know, it's guidance for the applicant and it's also guidance for, for staff. I, I can stop here if you'd like. Yeah, that sounds good. Pam? Well, Amanda, you have your hand up. Do you want to ask first? Sure, I can go first. Um, so, so one basic thing and then a couple of questions. The first one is the sub numbers on this one got inverted. <laughs> <laughs> so so they they all say 3.325 instead of 3.352 um, oh yes i right <laughs> I thought I changed that's that. a really simple one but i, uh, I changed that i thought i changed that but yes i see that okay a, a couple of questions i think you answered my first one which was condition six and sort of seven that all deal with a uh, tips is my understanding deals with actual alcohol but i could be wrong and and condition six as you said deals with alcohol because it is it because it says as if applicable at the top that means if they're not going to get that license they don't have to deal with those conditions or are they still going to have to buy an electronic id verifier even if they're not serving alcohol because it's written in here no, because it says as applicable, they'd have to make a statement that they're not serving alcohol, right? So then they would have to say that, you know, in their application or somewhere that they, you know, explain why this isn't applicable. So, um, you know, it's in here. So then someone would say, well, well, we're not serving any alcohol. We don't need that. And so they'd have, you know, that would become, you know, a reference point in the future if they want to then serve alcohol. They have to come so, back and meet that. So my next question with that is, and then I have another one, but I'll let Pam go before I ask my second <laughs> set. Um, on, on this condition is, um, doesn't the Board of License Commissioners have the ability to make those requirements? And if so, why would we be putting it in a zoning bylaw when to me, it seems more like a Board of License Commissioners requirement, more logically with them before they issue that license to serve alcohol? Which 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 item? Maybe? I think it's uh, the six. electronic ID verification in particular. Yeah, and maybe seven too. Um, well, I think I think it's both. That, and I think it's good to have it reinforced. And so we could, you know, make this language a little bit more generic and say, you know, um, ID verification. You know, 
um, instead of like electronic, but I think, you know, um, you know, it's somewhat redundant, but at the same time, it's something the ZBA typically asks for. So they, they include this in their permits because, you know, if somehow there's a lapse or there's something, we want to be able to say this is also required from a building inspection standpoint, mm. from a permitting standpoint, so we can we can act on it. Okay, thank you. Um, Pam, do you want to go or do you want me to go to my next question? Go ahead. All okay. right, my next one is with condition 10, um, which is apparently the only one that's been left from the current bylaw. Yes. Um, I, I don't understand why we need a seat restriction in BN. Um, if you look at the Hope and Feather site, the old VFW building, BN is so small, there's not many sites there. But those two sites in particular seem to me that they'd be big enough for more than 30 seats, at least even on one floor, let alone if you did a two floor split like some do in the BG. Um, so what's the purpose of a 30 seat restriction? Because it doesn't seem, it, it borders on a BVC district, it, you know, it, it seems a little bit heavy handed. And then along with that, is the 100 foot requirement only applicable to the BN district? And also why? Again, why it almost seems like it might actually limit the plots that you could put a cafe on um in the B bn even though it's so small um you know because of that 100 foot requirement the bn site doesn't require any particular lot frontage for non-residential uses according to my reading of the table right. um, and side setbacks and rear setbacks are only 10 feet but if it setbacks to a residential building you might not be able to put any building on that site for a cafe and so I'm, I'm looking for why we need this um, and what what benefit it does to diversify our food and drink establishments throughout town. Right. And so, yeah, so condition 10, you know, is just for the BN. So all those uh, clauses and everything, it only applies in the BN. And so, you know, agree with Mandy that it's um, it is restrictive. Uh, staff feels like when the BN was adopted, it really is a transitional uh, area. You know, it's not BBC, it's BN. Um, there are probably about six properties, seven properties that this could apply to. So the, the BN is a very small district. It's only in that one area, right? So it's 321, 319, 321 Main Street. It's the Amherst Media Lots. It's the VFW. It's a few, few other properties in that area. Um, but, but it is surrounded by residential areas, um, typically with buildings closer than you know other commercial or bg areas and so you know when when you know th these conditions were put in there kind of as a safeguard to the neighborhood and so you know we're proposing to leave them in um it is a discussion point um so you know i think that's really you know why they're there so you know some of it is they're smaller buildings smaller uses so we're you know we were thinking so you know you could be under 30 seats right so the idea is that a, a small establishment could be allowed um there is this 100 foot buffer um but you know the thought was to try to have you know smaller um you know uses that aren't open too late in the bn the lumber yard was that the bn yeah yes no, it's, it's across the street so that's bvc that's uh business village center um not on the map i was looking at it looked like it would be part of bn but maybe not I can. Um, the I have lumber that. yard was on the west side of Dickinson Street, right? The um, right. So the lumber yard is on the south side of um, of the street. But the west it's, side of Dickinson. The west side, yes. Yeah, so the that That's whole the area. That whole area. Um, is, B, is business village center to the train tracks. And so- mm -mm. Not on the zoning map. Uh, I'm online right now and it no. is. I can, I can share my screen if you wanted. The, the zoning map I downloaded said it was BN. That one parcel was BN. Yeah, so, so depending on if you look at it, so this is the, um, you know, the town's online mapper. So BN is here. We're saying that this area right in here is all business village center. So, you know, um, the lumber yard, here's uh, Bruno's, here's an apartment building on the corner. This is all BVC. BN is north of the street. 
But isn't the, the lumber least. yard this one spot? Yeah. Yes. The Mandy, lumber yard is this one BN spot on the west side. That's where the lumber yard Mandy, was. Correct. No, I'm afraid not. The lumber yard is south of Main Street and it's um where you say that's right that, there. That plot where your your thing no, is. No, this that's not the lumber yard. This is 319, 321 Main Street. This is where the, the frame shop is, mm -hmm. where the dog wash is right here, and where the you know used to be a dance studio. So the lumber yard was over here. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, you're right. Okay. I thought there was a restaurant in that BN section at one point. There was. Uh, I still thought it was okay. That's good clarification. I still thought that was BN, but BN so across BN, the street. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But it means this BN section where the center dance studio is and the frame shop is yeah. could basically never be a restaurant ever. Uh, if you draw a measured length, you could say, right. So it's uh, forty feet. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, between the building and then you know this is this these are john robleski you know, this is being redeveloped with housing this you know this building was preserved so this not that it couldn't become a mixed-use building but these are now residential uses um you know this is pretty close to the property line so you know you can see 100 feet yeah. is uh yeah but the vfw then could also basically never be a max yeah. used for a restaurant not that building um you, no. know, it's, you can see where 100 about 100 feet is from that building and then i guess this is a another 100 feet so yeah so there's a pretty small area where you could develop or you have those uses yeah i guess i'm not i would like to see that the 9 p.m. thing is fine for me on that one because that makes sense in a residential neighborhood, but mm -hmm. the 100 foot I'm struggling with. Okay. In particular, and the 30 seat one. All right. Pam. Okay, so to, to build on that one a little bit, um, in just in thinking about the, the Amherst Media site, which is BN, um, Clearly, you don't you don't want something that's that's um, contrary to the historical site, I guess, surrounding it, and as well as the, the the clearly residential aspect of the north side of Main Street. So that's that's of interest. Um, if we were to go back to uh, I, again, though, but I want to I want to build. I'm not sure exactly how to set it on condition ten. Um, I see that as, as I think Nate said, as a safeguard to the residential areas around it. There's sort of a similar scenario playing through my head that we have other, other business districts that in fact are also surrounded fairly closely by residential districts. And so we have perhaps the, the need and or whatever we end up determining with the BN we have some similar um, concerns, I think, about what actually goes into some of the, the spaces. Um, so one of the things that comes to mind is the fact that we've, we've done away with, or you're proposing to do away with the closing time. And I can share a story about the BL. Um, Primo Pizza has tried twice to actually expand their hours of operation. And they back up, even though it's more than 100 feet, they back up to residential, including me, um, and a lot of the neighbors on Cottage Street who can clearly hear all the car noise, all the, uh, you know, the, the Bank of America pin pad beeps, and the and and clearly people coming and going out of the, the stores there or primos so when primo wanted to go past 11 30 it was it was not it was not conducive to a residential setting the way it, the way it actually functions so i want to make sure that we that we are able to um maintain some control over hours of operation and so when you said that you know a lot of people would come in for a class one permit and then quickly go to class two um, 
there was a reason I think for having that class one classification. So I, I want to see if you could give some real good thought to how we can, maybe that becomes a condition that if music is, is, is involved or if there are um, hours of operation past 1130 that, um, that perhaps there needs to be a stronger review of it than, than maybe just site plan review. I don't want to, I don't want to shut the door to um, opportunities for new establishments, but I think each and every one of them unfortunately needs to get reviewed in the context of its setting. Um, so how do we, how do we keep that protection, um, especially for music, and especially for closing hours. And if the closing hours are later and the alcohol is later, we who live right next door to these things understand what that actually means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, quickly, so the BN, as many pointed out, is really flexible in terms of its dimensional standards and other requirements, unlike other zoning districts. And so that's why, you know, some of these conditions were put in here for the BN specifically in terms of size and location from buildings. In terms of the hours of operation, you know, what staff found is that the ZBA would almost always approve a class two restaurant um, with conditions. And those that became a standard set of conditions that would manage um, a location and then can be used by inspection services. And so, you know, what we're proposing here with these, you know, one through nine, especially with number four and five, you know, we'd be asking someone to explain how they're going to manage, um, you know, closing hours or late hours. And so, you know, um, the building commissioner and, and staff thinks that that could be handled without necessarily a special permit. And so, you know, if, if they propose in their management plan to be open late, typically, you know, we in the bylaw already, we have um, a decibel level if there's music. Um, you know, we have not followed. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but we do. So there are things in the bylaw that already regulate this. So, you know, the thought is that what we're asking someone to submit here is enough to put conditions on something to try to manage that. And if there's problems, then it becomes, you know, it might be that they trigger a new permit, right? If there's, if there's chronically issues, even after enforcement actions, then, you know, then there has, then there may be some other way to resolve it, but. Could we, could we at least um, include the words music um, in the management plan shell? Number, number five. Mm -hmm. It says noise containment, but I'd, I'd really like to have them because if, if it's going to go to, I mean, the abutters should be aware if the abutters are a series of student rental units, maybe they don't care, but maybe the student unit, you know, rental units will, if my, you know, if my dream comes true, they'll turn back into, into single family homes um, that are occupied by families with kids. So I, I would like to include music as a component of consideration, just like everything else is a component of, of consideration. Mm -hmm. I mean, music is more offensive to me than signage, for instance, that, that kind of thing. And we also have live or pre-recorded music is a, an accessory use. So if a, if a use doesn't have music now and they're proposing to add it, that, already, that automatically triggers a special permit or a site plan review. So that couldn't be approved administratively. So, so if, if someone applies for section 5.041, it automatically triggers a special permit? We'll get to that, but we're saying that it would be permitted as the same way the principal use would be permitted. And so if, if there was already, for instance, a site plan review that allowed outdoor dining or pre-recorded music, then that could carry. But if it was a new, you know, say a place that, you know, a restaurant that never had music before now wants to add music, that would trigger depending on, you know, site plan review or special permit, it would trigger a permitting process. Okay, what about the, what about the hours of operation then and, and serving of alcohol? Because again, the, the issue with Primo's was that that activity around the, around the building. I mean, in the summertime, you can hear it going on. And, and I like to try to go to bed by 11. I don't get there very often, but I, I certainly would not want that noise level to continue past 1130, no matter what. 
Mm -hmm. So BL, BL is one of these zones like BL, BVG, um, BVC. There, you know, there is there is adjacent neighborhood activity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you were speaking, it made me think, you know, whether it's in the management plan or somewhere else, we could, um, you know, have some language about, um, um, you know, location to um, abutting uses or, you know, have have the applicant describe, you know, what they're doing, um, you know, to mitigate any, any impacts to budding properties or something. And so we could, you know, I, you know, we could try to have some language in there. Um, typically we ask for that, but we could try to have it, you know, in, in a standard of condition here. So whether it's part of the management plan or yeah, I think it becomes, that's great. I think it becomes that's just as another, another, um, bullet under four or something, I don't know. So yeah, I, it's interesting. I think we could maybe have, get some language in there. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer. I, I, Pam kind of co covered what I was going to say. Cause I, yeah, I was just concerned, particularly with BL and vi village centers. So now Carmelita, I guess would be an example where it seems to be on a busy street. It's on 116, but then it actually, you know, abuts. I know when I park there at night, you know, the townhouses are right there. Right. So just that it's, um, it seems with the village centers and in some of the BL that they, um, you know, they really abut, they're like a, a house, a backyard or a driveway will be on one side of it. So just mm -hmm. to be able to provide protections for the residential neighborhood that is sometimes literally right there in the parking lot. Right, and so it's, yeah, I think, right. So, you know, typically staff or the, or, you know, the building commissioner and staff, you know, or the permitting boards would always ask for, you know, an explanation of that. And, you know, I think, like I said, if we can add language here to, try, you know, also indicate to the applicant that we're always looking for that, you know, whether or not it's site plan review or administrative approval, just to have them start considering that. So, you know, you know, I see this as, you know, like I said, this is guidance for an applicant and it's guidance for staff. And so right now we don't, we don't, you know, when someone applies, the Jen Mullins, the permit administrator will say, oh, here's what you need you need to submit these plans, but if we have it in the bylaw, it becomes, you know, it's, it becomes a requirement. And so, and it's out, it's out there, right? Someone can't say, oh, I, you know, I don't know, I needed to submit a site plan. You know, where do you say a site plan? And now we're saying it's right here, you know, and it can just yeah. become, yeah. Hi, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to take a different tact um, mm -hmm. than Pam and Jennifer and say, I would be concerned about adding too many conditions regarding abutting to residential neighborhoods. Um, our entire BL abuts to a residential neighborhood up the back, right? Um, right? Because it's supposed to be a transition zone. Um, but I guess that means to me that the residences that abut to the BL have to recognize that they abut to a transition zone and may not have full quiet because they're in a transition zone, you know, they abut to that transition zone. And so I think we have to consider both sides of this. And I, I worry that maybe we go too far to um, not to, to refusing to acknowledge or being unable to acknowledge that a BL is supposed to have commercial activity in it. And that might mean um, food and drink establishments maybe not past 1130 and, and you know, <laughs> you know what I, you know, give me, give me time, Pam, you know, but, but I would worry um, that, that any conditions added to this, like I said, for a BN, I'm fine with the 9 PM, right. You know, like that, that one didn't necessarily worry me as much as the hundred foot limit worried me. And so I, I would, I would be really, I would caution against putting too many restrictions in there um and too much things in there but before i say i couldn't get behind it i'd need to see what's proposed but but i guess i i take the we have to recognize that the people that buy on property that abuts a business district should recognize that they abut a business district and they won't have the quiet environment just like if you buy on a property that that borders route nine you're gonna have truck traffic all night <laughs> and you're not going to be able to stop that you know you, you you have to recognize there's there's this pull and there's this tension right and and i worry any conditions would go too far one way um to the point where we lose the ability to have businesses 
in those areas. And so I would really want to see what the conditions come up to show before I go one way or another. That That's all I want to say. Sure. Um, so quickly, like for instance, I'm going to interrupt just for a second, Nate. So the transition zone is absolutely the key word because you have the you have the late nights, you have the you have the large venues in the BG. The transition zones are tapering down to right. normal business hours. You know, the banks close at five, the the pizza place stays open till 1130, but you don't have you don't have the one and two o'clock a.m closing times in the limited business district in the BG, I mean, in those transitional zones, that's, that's what they're there for. That's why I said I'd want to see what's written first <laughs> before I say yes or no to wh whether my concerns are. So I didn't, I didn't ask, I didn't ask for no. a, like a, a separation distance for the BL. I, you know, I didn't bring that up. I just said, but what we can control is the activity um, timing, the hours of operation and, um, and the noise. So I would rather push for that kind of thing than saying, oh, you can't build within, you know, 50 feet of, of my neighbor's house. So yeah, so quickly, right now the management plan, what we're saying here is we're asking for this information and we say any other requested information. And you know the hours of operation or the trash. I mean, those aren't. That's not a, a condition. But what we do is we turn that into into a condition, right? So if they tell us they're going to open nine to nine, the condition is you you have to operate nine to nine. If you say your trash is going to be inside, your trash has to be inside. And so, in terms of um, what Pam was saying, you know, we could say again, it's as applicable. We could add something here, um, you know, like just it'd be generic language, like. Um, you know, uh, measures or strategies to buffer abutting properties, right? And, there you and, go. and, and it's, it's not, it doesn't, it's not a condition, but basically the applicant is going to have to respond to that with a statement. And then that becomes something we can put as a condition. Okay. They say they're going to have crowd control, or they say they're going to put up a fence or they're going to have screening or whatever, right? Lights going to be dimmed at 10 o'clock and, you know, they're not going to let noise, you know, they, you know, so it, it would just be, to me, it's a it's a um, it's like an indicator for an applicant and staff to start thinking about it and maybe turn it into a condition. And so, to me, it would just be like some generic language here after right. employee parking. It wouldn't be you can't do this. It would you know or or something it would just be like uh, supply information about this. So then that that we can staff can make it a condition or the board can make it a condition. Okay, thank you. Yeah, now, and then I think we'll try to move on to the next article. So that's good. So one quick one quick example. We lived at 188 Sunderland Road. We rented a house for seven years there, and diagonally across the road was now the Harp. It was Mike's Westview. Mike's Westview was notoriously poorly managed. So we had the the urination on the lawns, et cetera, et cetera, the bad parking, et cetera, the trash. So the um they brought they asked they requested to have outdoor music and it went to the select board and the few the few neighbors that were there were just really clear that they were already a nuisance they were already poorly managed and to think of the the decibels that they would not manage well either was really detrimental to that little that little cluster of homes that thing that you know, on, and now, but now the harp does have outdoor space. They do have outdoor music. They happen to be better run, but it's it was just a matter of luck that it was a good manager as opposed to the really bad one. So you don't know when you're permitting something ultimately how well they're going to follow your your guidelines. So I just want to um, understand that. Yeah, and let's let's get it going, but it but it needs to have some teeth in it. Right. You know, back to that location, I will say staff, you know, both from town hall, you know, police, fire, whomever, public works even has met many times with those managers and owners to make sure that that the space works. And so some of it was, you know, staff um, working with with an applicant and, you know, an owner. So it's it, it's been that's become, a, you know, it's a, a good success story. Um, if we move on. So this is Article three, the use chart. The next one we're just going to go in um, in order is the accessory uses. 
And this is shown as, you know, what's proposed is in bold italics and what's being removed is in the red strike through. And so right now this is, you know, for accessory uses only for retail and business um, and consumer services. So, you know, it's not all of article five, it's just this one 5.04. Uh, right now we have um, that outdoor dining is allowed as an accessory use to a restaurant, cafe, lunchroom, cafeteria, refreshment stand, drive through fast food eatery, or a bakery, gallery, other similar establishment for the production and sale of food or beverages, or to a retail store or convenience store selling prepared or packed food or beverages under um, a special permit or site plan or view, whichever is required for the principal use. And so now that we're redefining, proposing to redefine restaurant and the fact that this, this is somewhat, um, you know, staff was saying, well, can we just say a principal use authorized by section three and subject to the same review as the required for the principal use? And so what this does is in the B, BG, BL, BVC, you know, it's only those five districts, BN and COM, outdoor dining could be allowed, um, you know, if it's, you know, if it's accessory to uh, any use in the use chart. And so there was some concern that says, wow, so that means a gas station could have outdoor dining. And yes, maybe uh, elsewhere in Article 5, we say the accessory use has to be uh, customary in Hampshire County. So it can't just be some kind of one-off. And the way we define accessory is it has to support the principal use. And so, you know, right, I mean, sometimes a gas station does have a Dunkin' Donuts next to it. They might have a small coffee shop that serves coffee to their customers, and it could be accessory, um, right? So they could have an accessory bakery or something. We're not talking about that. We're talking about outdoor dining. So it would be hard for businesses in these districts, you know, other than say a food establishment to say, okay, well, outdoor dining is accessory to our use. You know, um, a retail store can't really say outdoor dining is accessory. You know, they have to, they have to really prove that to staff and to the board or building commissioner. And so that's, you know, that's what that change. Um, I'm just going to scroll down. Uh, in 5.041, what it really had said was that, um, it, you know, the accessory outdoor dining had to be taken or closed between November and April. And we learned that it, it can operate during those times. And so we're proposing to say that any structure now in the outdoor dining area, um, you know, so long as that accessory use is active and operational. Yep. And so if someone wants to have outdoor dining year round and clear snow and provide heaters, before they wouldn't have been able to do that. But now, now it could happen. Um, further down in the section, originally said no such facility. So the outdoor dining area couldn't be equipped with freestanding heaters or coolers or served by an HVAC system from a neighboring building. During the pandemic, you know, we allowed the heaters and we realized, you know, it extends the dining, right? It actually keeps people downtown longer. So, so we deleted this um, to, you know, go with these changes up above. Um, for live or pre recorded music, Again, we say to any principal use in section three, we remove the restaurant bar or in. Um, so now live or pre-recorded music is can be accessory to any principal use um, through the same permitting, special permit or site plan or view. So what that means is if someone, you know, if it's a special permit use, it's a bar and they want to go to music, then that accessory use is a special permit accessory use. Um, and I think those are the changes um, oh, in, in this drive-through facility because we're, no, we're deleting a drive-in restaurant. Um, we're deleting it from the definitions in Article 12. And so we're deleting this reference here. Just um, what we're saying up above now is that it can be accessory. So we really don't have a drive-in as a principal. I mean, it could be a restaurant now, but you know, we no longer have this kind of this use in section 3.352. So you we know, are proposing to remove it. So we're proposing to delete it here. Questions? Pam. Uh, can you go back to the bottom there where you just left off, Nate? Yeah, so drive-in, do, do we think that we just won't have any more drive-in uses or was there, was there a reason to actually <laughs> eliminate that? No, I think so. You know, I talked to the building commissioner. So he was saying, you know, it's interesting that typically we would say a drive in would be a restaurant and then the drive in part would be accessory. And so 
you know, the, the way we were defining a drive-in or a drive-through was literally you only have a takeout window. You know, it's like a small little shack and you're serving coffee out the window and there's really no seating, no patrons ever use the inside of a building. Mm -hmm. And even that, the building commission was saying it could still be a restaurant, we call, you know, or a cafe with, with an accessory drive-through. And so it's just kind of the way it was permitted. We never, we never really permitted a drive-in restaurant as a principal use. It was always a restaurant with a drive through as an accessory. And so it's got it. Um, so, so your explanation, if you go back up to the top, the explanation of the fact that you're really dealing with uh, the principal use uh, authorized by section 3.3. Right. Um, remind me, is three, I could look it up, but I, 3.3 so that that's, that's, that, that's the use chart. So, like, for instance, in the BG, or BL, I know, you know, I know but is 3.3 specifically retail businesses and consumer services? No. Oh, okay. So it really, it really, um, you're just saying that if there is an accessory activity requested, it has to be um, relative to the principal use. I, when I went to definitions, though, I didn't actually see a definition for accessory use. Yeah. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, I, I, um, it's, it's mentioned in the earlier sections of Article 5. And so, you know, I'm only showing the one. Okay. 5.04. So it, it, it is clearly defined somewhere. Yeah. And so, you know, I, this was asked as well. So wait, so you, you know, um, the planning board was saying what? So now, like the funeral home could have outdoor dining and, you know, Douglas Funeral Home. And we're saying, well, the way the bylaws are written, yes, through, you know, through permitting at the same time, you know, the way the building commissioner explained it, you know, to have outdoor dining, you have to go and get a food license. You have to have a kitchen, you know, which might cost a hundred thousand dollars. You have to go through board of health. You have to go through a, a whole set of inspections and, you know, spend a lot of money to actually have outdoor dining. So it's not going to, it's not going to be taken lightly by an applicant or property owner. So, you know, um, I think at the planning board meeting, someone said, wow, this is really opening it up too much. Right. But I think in reality, someone is not going to undertake the expense or the time to have outdoor dining, knowing that, you know, if they, if they come to the town, you know, you know, right. Say Zana came to the town and said, oh, I'd love to set up outdoor dining. We say, okay, well, how is the accessory? And then do you know, to do that, you need to go through, here are your steps. And they might say, wow, okay, I'm willing to spend a lot of money and time and hire and go through the board of health and license commissioners and do this. Or they might say, okay, it's really not um, worth it. But so we're saying, well, if they actually want to do it, and we think it is accessory to their store. What if they want to have like you know uh, you know something that we we can't conceive of right now? Then let's let's have let's let's say it is accessory and give them a shot. Otherwise, you know it wouldn't be possible in the way it's currently written. Okay, okay. so I I feel I feel comfortable leaving it like this, mm -hmm. given that it's very very unlikely, and especially right. with something that has to go through a permitting process anyway, it would be very unlikely that you wouldn't get a food or drink related accessory use. Right. Okay. Um, question on the, the, the paragraph, uh, let's see, it's part of 5.041. Oh yeah, right there. It's uh, in residential districts, seasonal outdoor dining may be permitted as accessory use to a farm stand restaurant. Um, first of all, do we have restaurants in residential districts to begin with? No. The, how did how so, did well, restaurants? So it's we allow a farm stand where a certain you know a, you know twenty five percent of what's grown on the property can be um, at the farm stand, and so um, you know what we're saying then is that if they wanted to have some dining associated with it, it could be accessory. But uh, Chris has her hand raised. I mean, if there's a better yeah, Chris. I think some of it was we're, we're calling it a farm stand restaurant, and it may just be that that's not great language. Um, well, if an example of a farm stand restaurant is Maplewood Farms that operated for a certain number of years and then it went out of business. They could have had um, an accessory use of outdoor dining under this um, bylaw here. But they, as but I they, said, they went out of business, but they are in a residential district. They're in the RN zoning district. They're, they were allowed to operate that because they were saying that they were serving a certain amount of produce that was grown on their farm or grown in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, it didn't work out as a business model, but nonetheless, they did operate for a while. So 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna segue just for a second. That's probably another zoning section that that we should be looking at, which is the farm stand, because it's it's again it's class one and class two are pretty you know iffy. The, yeah. So the differentiation. I don't want to I don't want to get off on that, but that's um, um, so that answers the question. There really aren't any food and drink uses. So the a question that I did have though is um, how do we look at this or any other zoning article to allow or encourage um, event um, events, public events or private events um, on venues such as a farm um, with some sort of protection of neighbors, you know, due to, to traffic noise and, and music kind of thing. Does does this um, do these changes allow for any of that? Not not really. And so, you know, the town is working with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission through a technical assistance grant to look at temporary uses and events. And you know, what you're describing, Pam, would be more relevant to that. And so, this isn't you know taking um, you know events or other uses. It's really you know these three accessory uses: outdoor dining drive throughs or live or pre-recorded music. So it's not talking about, you know, having a farm, you know, having a wedding. This doesn't deal with that at all. Um, and so right now we are working on it. So even uh, staff is also looking at, you know, some, you know, some things from Article 14, what we learned during COVID, you know, also looking at, um, in addition to temporary uses, you know, what are, you know, outdoor dining and some other things, how can we make that update that, you know, including the farm stand piece. And so, we're looking at that, but it's not being addressed at all in these changes. Okay, so in number 5.042, uh, we talk about the live and pre-recorded entertainment. Um, again, I understand that, I don't know if music, if music is a little different than, than outdoor dining, um, it feels like that could be applied to more principal uses than just food and food and business, I mean, food and drink establishments. So maybe 5.042 really wants to reflect food and drink related businesses rather than opening up to the whole kit and caboodle. Um, Cause you know, I was sort of thinking, so maybe there's a marijuana shop that wants to have an outdoor event and they've got, you know, party space. Maybe it's not outdoor dining, but it's outdoor party. Yeah, I mean, we're, we also have these other pieces of the bylaw. So if it's, you know, 150 feet or less from a residential district, um, dwelling in a residential district, it's a, it's a special permit. And we also have these other conditions already in the bylaw. It has to be clearly accessory and incidental to the principal use. And then we have, you know, um, a, a sound level at the boundary of the property. Um, and so, you know, staff has found that these, these um, standards that are in the bylaw work really well to manage something that wants to do this. And so. Um, okay. And so that again, that, that back to Mandy's, Mandy's point about the transition zones. Um, if, if we follow through with those conditions, which are pretty specific, um, I think we're okay. Mm -hmm. Now we go to, I guess, article 11 is next. Sure, Article 11, this, this um, so our, in Article 11, it's um, administration and enforcement. And so this is uh, where we talk about site plan review and what um, can happen administratively. And so again, um, what we're doing, uh, we're changing 11.21. Uh, it really is just applicability now and we're calling it administration and applicability. And um, you know, there, we have a different version that would be referred to uh, the council because this is somewhat misleading, but what's shown here in red, um, these three first bullets are already in the bylaw. Why the red here is with track changes, they're renumbered and they're nested now. We're creating a new 11.211 saying site plan review shall not be required when, and we're just listing these changes out um, in a little different order. So it's clearer for both applicants and staff. And we change the language slightly. So this, you know, these these conditions are already in the bylaw. If there's no physical change to the exterior of either the building or the site, 
the only change to the exterior of a building or site includes the installation of signs in compliance with Article 8 of the, of the zoning bylaw. Uh, a change of use is proposed and no physical changes to the exterior of a building or site will occur. And the building commissioner determines that the change will not conflict with the purpose of the bylaw and finds that the proposed use will not result in the need for further review under section 11.243, which is below. So we're just, re we're moving these around. These are already in the bylaw. Um, minor alteration for a building to, um, to exterior site. We, we're right here, currently it says administrative approval for a minor alteration. And now we're, we're nesting this under when no site plan review is required. So essentially the building commissioner would say that the work could proceed if, you know, these conditions are met. And this is already in the bylaw, uh, A through F. The, the really big change to the section 11 is this administrative approval process in instances where site plan review is not required. And so this is what we've kind of adapted from um, article 14. And so this administrative approval is really, you know, nested under this section only when site plan review is not required. And we're saying that um, no work shall commence until the building commissioner has authorized the work or the use to proceed. The building commissioner may approve, approve with conditions, page break here, or deny the proposal. Decisions shall be made in writing, filed with the town clerk and kept on record, you know, in the conservation and development uh, department in town hall. The building commissioner in consultation with the planning director shall be authorized to apply any design review, review criteria found in article three, section 3.204, uh, the design review principles and standards. And so currently, this one section here, um, this administrative approval, the building commissioner kind of does this already, but the, it, the bylaw isn't really allowing the building commissioner or that position to approve or approve of conditions or deny. And you know, we found that through article 14, um, we actually want the building commissioner, if things are approved administratively, to be able to put conditions on it. And so what's happened in the past, the building commissioner might say yes document it with an email, but really it's not formalized. And so by putting it in the bylaw, it becomes something where there's this written decision that's filed with the town clerk. You know, we, we actually would have an application process for this through our permitting software. And so now, even if it's administratively approved, we have, you know, they have to submit a management plan, a site plan, a floor plan. So we have all these documents that are part of a record. Uh, currently, it really isn't formalized. We may ask for it, but an applicant could say, well, I meet this condition up here. I'm not making any changes to the exterior. I don't need to do anything except for apply for a building permit, right? Because this, this, the, they, you know, they meet these conditions, which are already in the bylaw. And the building commissioner typically will say, no, let's wait. We want to see these things, but really the bylaw isn't asking for it. And so we just want to make sure the bylaw is giving, you know, giving applicants and, and staff enough information so we can make a decision. Thanks. Um, so I had a couple of questions, which is why I raised my hand. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is with this. Well, the first one's more. Um, the first one's sort of easy. This eleven point two one one. When you added the subsections, right. when I read site plan review, when I read it in conjunction with two one one three, site plan review shall not be required when minor alteration to building exterior or site semicolon. Yeah. It it reads weird. <laughs> so I. I when you I, I like how you changed the other three and I did I like that you kept in the comments the deleted so I could see that they did match so mm -hmm. maybe some sort of rephrasing so that it reads similar to right zero one and two which actually read like a sentence you know yes. not required when there is no physical change when the only change is two you know so that's just a minor thing my bigger concern is with actually the language that's in um. Uh, highlighted in yellow found in article three, section 3.204 design review principles and standards. Um, if I've read the design review section correctly, um, it only applies that section itself in theory only applies to the BGBL areas within 150 feet of the common and town owned buildings. Um, but when you add this language in here, are we now basically saying, oh, we're going to add it so that it can apply to BN, BVC, COM, all these other areas in town that it wasn't really originally written to apply to. 
And so uh, it, 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 am I reading that right? That it essentially means that now design criteria will be applied outside of what the DRB's limited purview was? Yes and no. Um, so currently in, in the bylaw, we still say other review. The building commissioner may seek guidance in reviewing um, you know, criteria from town staff or design review board or historical commission. Um, and so um, you're right in the sense that the building commissioner may now apply design review principles outside of the design review district. But that's something that the, the building commissioner is already authorized to do. So sometimes if say a restaurant's going into North Amherst and it's not in the design review district and it could be administratively approved because it's going into a current restaurant space, the building commissioner often just sends the applicant to the design review board anyways, if they're proposing a lot of changes. Um, and so, you know, what we're saying here now is the building commissioner in, in consultation with the planning director, you know, shall be authorized to apply. So we're not saying that they shall apply. We're giving the building commissioner the authorization to apply them. Um, because, you know, again, if the building commissioner right now was to tell an applicant that, um, you know, or in, in, a, in a, the building permit refers to design review principles, an applicant could try to argue that that's not really applicable. Um, and so we, we actually do want the building commissioner through administrative approval to be able to apply these. And so um, it's only for administrative approval, right? This is only if there's no site plan review required. If site plan review is required, um, the design review board is often used as an advisory recommendations to the planning board for a project. And so any time, you know, in any instance, the ZBA or planning board can ask the design review board for assistance reviewing a project, whether or not it's in the design review district. And this just authorizes, it authorizes him to go seek that advice. Or no, it also, it authorizes the building commissioner to apply. apply to actually apply them, this. not just get the advice, to like require things be complied with instead right. of seeking the advice. But this other review is currently in the bylaw and remains. So for instance- But that's guidance. Yeah, as guidance, yep. But this first, the first one with the, in yellow is, shall be authorized to apply. Apply is different than guidance, right? Um, you know, guidance is, well, we can seek guidance, we can seek suggestions, but we can't force. Mm -hmm. Apply is, you can force. Well, I mean, I. So I, I agree. So it's, you know, it is saying that we're, we could, the building commissioner could apply the design review principles outside the area, but, you know, because there's no site plan review here, you know, what if it's just a terrible design, you know? I mean, I'm being honest. That's in the eye right? of the beholder, right? I well, think that's well, what the, the building point, is saying right? That, you know, what if they're saying that is, you know, what you're proposing there is something that, so if the building commissioner thinks that it, so anyways, if there's a big change to the exterior, then it triggers site plan review. So in very few instances, are there much in the design review principles that the building commissioner could apply because if there's changes, it automatically triggers site plan review. But what it is doing is it's saying, okay, say there's minor changes. Um, they still could use the design review principles. I'm gonna have to think about that one, but thank, I, I'm, I'm understanding it a little better, but I'm gonna have to think. Jennifer. Yeah, I just for my, we just want some clarification because I um, may not be understanding this. It may be clear to everybody. Um, is so right now? Are there instances when abutters are notified that they won't be if this is adopted? So right now, under administrative approval, um, if we go back up, although it's red here, these are already in the bylaw. So if, for instance, you know, 10 years ago, a use was permitted and they, they, you know, they stop operation and a new use comes in and they're not changing the physical building or site, or they meet these, these conditions, it's administratively approved right now. It doesn't go to a public hearing and we're not necessarily changing that. And so in that instance, the abutters are not notified. And so typically the planning board, you know, with a class one restaurant, because of the expense and the time to actually outfit a space as a restaurant, you know, say like Thai Corner is a bad example, it's downtown, but say where Thai Corner is, it's now, um, I was gonna say Rice Delicious, but I'm not sure that's right. Um, 
anyways, it's, it was permitted as a, as a restaurant. The restaurant goes out of business. A new restaurant comes in and occupies the space. They make no changes at all to the, to the site except for a new sign. Right here, that new restaurant is administratively approved and actually never goes through site plan review. If they want to, if they want to add outdoor dining, all of a sudden that outdoor dining is not part of the original site plan that triggers a public hearing. Um, and so, you know, we're not changing that, but what we are changing is when it is administratively approved, we're now allowing, or, you know, we're proposing that the building commissioner could approve, approve the conditions or even deny that administrative approval. And right now the bylaw isn't, isn't clear on that. Essentially it says, if there are no changes, it's basically a building permit. And through article 14, we found that the administrative approval process works really well. You know, we ask for plans, there's a written decision, it has conditions and, you know, there's a record. And so right now they're really, that isn't necessarily happening for administrative approval. And so we're actually making administrative approval a little stronger. Um, Thank you. Um, Pam. Um, on that last, also on that same paragraph, um, I like the fact that the, 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 the person is going to consult with the um, planning director. I think that's a good thing and it's good to put it in writing. Um, I also would like to, to apply any design review criteria found da, 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 and include in the record. So I, I would like to, I would like to require that those design guidelines that were considered and applied be noted as part of that, I'll say the congressional record for that permit. Mm -hmm. I like, I'm sorry, I'm essentially, I'm supporting this, but I'd, I'd like to see that, that record that says we considered this, this, and this, and um, understanding that in general, these are cases where very, very few physical changes are being made to a site. But I think it's still, I think it's still appropriate if you're, if they're, if, if he or she, whoever is the, you know, the building commissioner, um, they still have to look at all of our essentially design guidelines um, that are in the bylaw now, and it'd be good to document them. Thank you. Um, seeing nothing else, I think we can move to Article 12. Sure. Which is really simple. Yeah, in Article 12, we have, uh, you know, currently the only changes are in bold or italics, you know, bold and italics or the red. So we have a definition for bar. It's a food and drink establishment or a part of such establishment devoted primarily to the service and consumption of alcoholic beverages on the premises. And it says, and in which service, service of food is only incidental. We're, we're proposing to change that to say maybe incidental. Um, we are um, proposing to delete a drive up restaurant. Um, just, you know, as mentioned before, it's something that really wasn't permitted. You know, we didn't we consider accessory. So we never actually really had a, a need for this definition. And, and, and um, I guess I'll say that a bar is used a few places in the bylaw, whereas a drive up restaurant previously was only used in the use table. So if we remove it from the use table, it's not referenced anywhere else in the bylaw. And so this just becomes um, kind of an irrelevant definition because it's not found anywhere else. So if we remove it from accessory uses in that table three, then it's nowhere else in the bylaw. Um, and after that, all the numbering changes. So, you know, um, because we're removing one, one definition, the rest of the numbers, you know, instead of this dwelling unit being 12.12, it's now 12.11. Yep. So those are the only changes in, in um, Article 12. There is a definition for a restaurant, which remains um, unchanged. And so really that those are the only changes. Um, so my only question is with the renumbering, because we were shown not full renumbering, and I wasn't sure whether you were planning on renumbering. I always get worried when you renumber an entire section in such a big document. Because what if you referenced that definition by number? Um, yeah. And so would it be better to just 
not renumber, delete drive-in restaurant or whatever it's called, drive-through restaurant, drive-up restaurant, and leave 12.11 there with the word reserved. So, so it's sort of like a blank mm -hmm. number without renumbering anything else. Or some other definition beginning with D. Yeah, no, yeah. Potentially, so we, right? Yeah, staff talked about that. So I, you know, what was, what, what was, what um, was developed for the council package uh, packet was all renumbering, um, but it could be that it just um, has that reserve. So that way we're preserving and that, you know, we had discussed that and we hadn't really come up with an answer, but. Um, I mean, I don't want to search the whole bylaw, but I worry that somewhere in the bylaw 12.18 is referenced that now we'll have to change to 12.17. Right, <laughs> yeah, we had, when we, re when uh, the bylaw was updated, uh, with staff, we try to refer to the, the defined term, not the number, but you, there could be some um, some places where that is the case. So, so if we're re I'm fine with renumbering. I would just ask that you check to make sure we don't have to change anything else. <laughs> Pam, I can, can I go back to um, section Article Eleven? I forgot one of my questions. Sure. Uh, in section, sorry, my light's getting my my light's getting bad. Um, Eleven two one one. In that in that section, we use the we use the term uh, change of use a lot, and I just want to make sure that we are using it consistently, or that we're all thinking about it in the same way. When when. Um, in building construction, there are there are uses. There's sort of there's there's office use, there's commercial use, there's residential use, and so that's a, a that's a use category or a use group. Or you've got you've got residential um, or assembly is another use group. So when we talk about change of use, that's where my mind always goes, rather than change of user. <laughs> so <coughs> a change of user. Um, in this case, it is a change of, it's not really a change of use. If you're going from one restaurant to another restaurant, in my mind, that is not a change of use. It's a change of user. How can we be, how can we be clear how the word's being used? Yeah. I mean, up above, we say uses for which site plan review is required you know, is based on table three. So I think in terms of land use permitting, a use is what those use classifications are. It's not the user. I think it's pretty, it's understood um, that, you know, change of use would be, you know, there's a retail space and now it's going to a restaurant space. I mean, that's a change in use. It's that's not- That's clearly a change of use, right? Yeah. yeah. But I think what Pam's saying is restaurant to restaurant is not a change in use. It's right. a change in user, but sometimes it still requires a brand new site plan review. Um, only if there are certain changes here. So non-minor. Right. <laughs> Significant. So, you know, if, um, well, so, so I think what Pam wants is clarification when using the term change of use, that it could mean restaurant to retail, but it could also mean restaurant to restaurant. If the restaurant seek, if the new owner is seeking different hours, say, right. Mm -hmm even though the use classification is not changing. Thank you. That was much more clearly said than I said it. <laughs> I'm glad I understood it, Pam. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anything else? No, it was good for me. We will see this and, and as part of my next agenda preview, I think I'm gonna try and get the notices out quick enough so that we can have a hearing on this on the 27th. Um, so that it'll be a, hear, a long hearing day on the 27th, where we'll just go through lots of hearings since we already have two. Um, but I'll, I'll think about that schedule more. Yeah, Pam? Just for clarica clarification, so CRC has talked about this, Planning Board has talked about this, it goes to count, Town Council for the, what, referral back to us for an official hearing, even though we've all talked about it about 10 times, um, it'll be an official hearing. Uh, and then it gets back to town council with a recommendation. Yes. So it'll the referral on Monday is for referral to both us and the planning board for um, formal hearing, the required hearing under state law and our recommendations. 
Um, and then from there, it would go to GOL after those recommendations are made for the final, you know, legal review type thing, and then back to council for the two readings and vote on it. Um, so this was the sort of preview so that hopefully that system moves a little more smoothly. That doesn't mean we won't be asking for more changes when we see it at the hearing, right? We might hear from more people, we might hear from that, but but we have found in the past, I think Chris and Nate will agree with this, that both planning board and CRC seeing some of this stuff before formal approval, um, formal referral makes the process go a little more smoothly um, just in terms of even knowledge of what we're talking about, right? Um, you know, that not that we're not going to change things or come in with other recommendations or questions and stuff. Does that explain it? Yep, thank you. Um, it is 6.05. We have 25 minutes left in our meeting. Um, I did not ever think we'd get through our whole agenda. I will just say that right now, and it's clear we will not. Um, but um, we're going to talk briefly about associate member vacancies and then move on to the nuisance house bylaw and leave residential rental bylaw for another time. Um, so associate members vacancies, there is no different status than two weeks ago. Um, that's why there's nothing else in the packet. Um, no different status. Um, so we do have to decide potentially whether we're just gonna let it hang out there. Um, we obviously can let it hang out there. We could make a recommendation to say, you know, we're not gonna try and fill these. Um, it's clear no one's interested or not enough people are interested or, you know, some weird thing. And I did not say that correctly because we do have potentially four people that have applied, right? That doesn't mean no one's interested. Um, we don't know whether they'd all go through the system, but, um, or we could say, you know, let's see what we move forward with and, and make decisions based on that. You know, those are sort of, or we could just punt it again for another one or two meetings. Thoughts, Jennifer. So what, what were we aiming for in terms of a date to have the interviews? Did we get that far? We, we never set dates because we don't set dates till we declare a full sufficient. Yeah. Um, I don't, um, yeah, you know, I mean, I made an announcement at our district meeting. I'm still reaching out, but yeah, I'm not yeah. having any papers. There, there wouldn't be interviews until November at this point. I always assume the interviews are a good month from when we declare the pool sufficient, um, mainly because it probably takes me about a week to poll to find a date. At this point, we can have another couple of weeks to try and get. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we yeah. Could, one option is to declare the pool sufficient with four potential applicants um, and three openings and revisit it later, but in order to try and set an interview date and aim as this, as CRC sort of talk about what type of interview date we're going to seek, we could potentially declare it sufficient, see who's files SOIs and not put the SOI deadline close to an interview date so that we can actually talk about whether after we get SOIs and before they're published, potentially, do we have a sufficient pool to go to interviews? You know, we could sort of take an interim step in there. There's all sorts of options, probably. Pam. So I I printed out the uh, the spreadsheet and since within the two year time frame of people submitting CAFs, there are currently twelve people that you know have submitted a CAF in the past. Only four or five of them. My light is really dim. I can't read this. There are only four or five of them that have submitted something since May. Um, so the question being, if if I were to go back to each and every one of those folks who submitted something, who I reached out to, um, many of them because they were interested in the planning board or ZBA, um, I could probably get maybe some or or equally negative responses from, from those folks again, but that's in hand at least 12 people who have submitted a, a CAF in the past. Is that, um, is that something that people feel I should take the time to do? So our rules require that we should have been reaching out to everyone in the past two years before we declare the pool sufficient. Um, so if that hasn't been done, we should do that and encourage people that that had a CAF submitted before May of this year, right? But within the last two years from when the bulletin board notice went out, which was 
August 1. Yeah. Um, you know, that that group needs reached out to and asked to resubmit a CAF to become an active applicant, right? Um, because they've expressed interest in the past. Um, we should certainly do that. I will say I'm not hugely positive and optimistic that we will get CAFs from anyone on that list. Um, simply because we all reached out to them as Pam, you know, you reached out to them in March, right? And right. we really didn't get caps from them on that list already, you know, um, other than the ones that we've appointed, right? Um, so, so that's why I guess I'm not quite optimistic that that those numbers will rise by doing that outreach. But the rules, our, our policy requires that we do have to do it. Okay, so I will just so um, I will reach out to all on that list again. Um, and I think given the fact that it's a ZBA alternate position, it is um, quite a bit less than the, than the time commitment for planning board or full ZBA. Um, maybe there's some response there because I think a couple of people were concerned about the, the amount of time. So given that it's a different position essentially that we're, that we're talking about, um, we'll see if we get some additional activity that way. Yeah, okay. And, and so maybe we put this back on for the 13th to potentially have see see if we got any response from those those other okay. eight or twelve and maybe make a decision then as to what we're gonna do. Yep. Does that sound like a plan, Jennifer? Yep. October 13, that's the one that you're not going to be there. That's the one that you're running whether or not I'm actually in attendance. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, yes. And, and I, I will talk to you, Pam, about obviously agenda setting for that. But Jennifer, sound like a good plan? Yes, I have a hard stop on the 13th for TSO. Yes, oh, because there's that other hearing, yeah. Okay, um, with that, we're gonna move on to the nuisance house bylaw. Um, and so the reason this is on here is we had a referral from the council, right? Um, and a little bit of background and, and I don't think we'll take too much time on this today, um, is that back when the new council was sworn in, the charter required a full bylaw review. And the bylaw review committee did that review, made the changes that needed to be made to conform to the new form of government, but then also had a whole lot of comments on other things. Jennifer's seen this in, CR, in GOL, we're going through it, right? And the nuisance house ones dealt with a lot of definitions. And so GOL referred it to CRC because they felt some of those definitions might be um, similar issues with the permitting bylaw we're working on, the residential permitting bylaw we're working on, and that we might want to, with those two bylaws, actually match definitions instead of have, for example, a property owner defined one way in nuisance house and another way in rental permitting. Um, and so today, <laughs> we're not going to get to the residential rental bylaw, but I put it on this one because we're now sort of into that looking at the definitions of the permitting bylaw. And so I thought it was good for us to bring that nuisance house in, look at that, see what the definitions are, see which one, you know, there was a legal review that we got about a recommended definition. We can look at that definition and say, hey, is that what we want for both of these bylaws? Do we want them separate? Do we not? And then we can look at doing stuff um, with other things. And so let me see um, what I have open. I don't even know what I have open as it relates to this. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm gonna try and pull up, I closed it, but I'm gonna pull up the, um, the memo that I included in this, um, actually the memo might not be the best thing to pull up, but um, let me pull up the nuisance house bylaw itself, um, if I can get it open. Um, but first I'll do the memo since the other one's not, not opening um, at this point. Um, it was, I, I just wanna make a comment about this bylaw article. Yeah. Is Chris leaving us? Or did she just disappear on the... I don't know whether she's fully leaving. Chris, are you still there? Pam might have a question for you on the no, bylaw. I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> I'm still here, yeah. Thank you. 
Um, yeah, so so this is the legal opinion in a sense um, that said we shouldn't change the alcohol definition, that the alcohol definition was sufficient. Um, we were told to look at the definition of property owner, alcohol definition, and enforcement section. And the legal opinion said the alcohol definition was sufficient. In enforcement, it answered the questions as to whether you could get response costs under non-criminal disposition, but then made a recommendation to potentially add the phrase, any means available in law or equity, so that you could charge the response costs, but you'd have to go to superior court to enforce it. Um, but it wouldn't prohibit then asking for them. Um, and then it talked about property owner and the legal opinion actually gave us a recommended property owner um, definition. Um, and let me see if I can pull up something else because I prepared, but it's not on a document. So let me see if I can get it on a document first. Um, While you're while you're doing that, um, it occurred to me that it's it's interesting because it talks about nuisance house, it talks about alcohol and gatherings, but nowhere in there does it actually say um, if you if you accrue uh, or if you get a first or second response, you will be considered a nuisance house, or if you <laughs> have a third a third response from the authorities you'll be a, a really bad nuisance house. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't, we might want to talk about some of that, right? It does not link the the categories to any, um, it, it just doesn't link it. Right. Or it's a real line. concern in the neighborhood that yeah. a house that is a nuisance, there doesn't seem to be any consequence. They keep, you know, getting their permit renewed and. Yeah, so what's showing on the screen now and we'll get to that part because I do want to talk about whether we'd like to look at other revisions to it um but this this definition is the one from the legal opinion as to that how they would define it the second one is how our current draft working draft of the permitting bylaw has defined owner um so one of the things I'd like to hear is is there one we particularly want to go with and would we want them to match we would want one and not two. That's my assumption that we want to go with what the lawyer said yes. and that we'd want it in both, right? I think the lawyer has probably got a pretty good handle on what you should say. <laughs> and and we'll put it in both so that I change the residential one too in the next yes. draft. Yes. And, and yeah. so then I thought, I looked at the rest of the definitions in the nuisance bylaw and they had a definition of premises. And I said, I wonder what we did with premises in the property, in the permitting bylaw. Well, we don't define premises, we define property. And so that's what's down here. Um, mm. So premises, and obviously the lawyer was not asked about this one, but premises in the nuisance bylaw is defined that way. And we defined property in the permitting bylaw, potentially um, maybe even a little, I, I'm not sure which one's more expansive actually. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna but I was wondering if people think we should have them agree in terms of their definitions, even I'm, if we refer to one as premises I'm and one as property. Christine. Yeah. Christine Chris is likely to be uh, you know interpreting some of this stuff. Well, to me, property means the parcel of land on which something exists, right. and premises could mean someone's unit on that parcel of land. So that's the distinction that I would make. Between these two words. Mm. So what you're saying is if it's a multifamily dwelling or multi-unit and one unit is the nuisance versus the whole building. Yes. And then that but the property the owner is still right. responsible for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so we actually need two, perhaps two, with premises being the residence, the dwelling unit. Hmm. So we might want to try and come up with a different definition for premises for and add property in for nuisance. And yeah. Yep, yeah, Jennifer. So it's something we hear from this may not be the time or place to address this, but we hear from landlords that they shouldn't 
or they're to be held responsible for the behavior of the tenant. So is this part of where we're addressing that? Um, so let me see if I can get my version of the <clears throat> actual bylaw to open and then I'll share that. And, and that's the next but thing. Clearly they, to... you know, a nuisance house, the, the property owner, the landlord has to be responsible for it. And, and that's where I wanted to talk a little briefly about this. We've got about five more minutes before we, we go on. Um, I wanted to talk more because I wanted to see how far into nuisance house bylaw we wanted to get, right? Um, in terms of enforcement and definitions, we were told to look at enforcement and definitions basically. And so enforcement's very expansive, right? Um, into basically the whole bylaw. Um, oops, let me see. And so the bylaw here, section B basically says, you can't consume an underage person can't consume alcohol which i'm not even sure why we would need that in nuisance but um seems well that's what i'm saying is that it doesn't it doesn't link that doesn't seem to link to anything right at all um but then it's the hosting permitting or allowing a public nuisance or party and so the question is is underage drinking considered a public nuisance right like again there's no linking here and then the hosting is you can't host. Um, the gathering could be a public nuisance. It goes on. Um, and then the next page um, is the notice of response to the gathering is mailed to a property owner and maybe the management company. But it doesn't say whether that's the on the first response or the second response, but it says that it advises them that a third response could result in liability. You know what, I, it, it feels like um, if we're considering a, a point system for good and bad behavior um, in, the, in the permitting bylaw that it feels like many of these elements um, are cause for points to accrue. And it feels like that's perhaps if we folded these, these practices and these people liable and the da 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 da, that, that I think we are also trying to grapple with and cover in the, in the, rental permitting so but the question but but the point being now that i'm talking out loud which helps um it occurs to me that maybe we we don't want to limit it to rental housing well what i was going to say is nuisance is not limited to rental housing right. so if right and that's that's what i just realized as i spoke through that that I hate being I hate being redundant, but maybe we could refer, you know, one way or the other to some of these definitions. And nuisance isn't just alcohol, like you know, it's noise. It's, it's noise. It it's can mostly be mostly noise, right? Yeah, I mean, like I just somebody not even in my district just said there was an issue with a bonfire on the front lawn. You know, which is there may have been alcohol involved, but. Yeah. So, so the alcohol one is number one, the underage drinking, it's not even, um, it's just underage drinking is number one. Number two is just public nuisance, but I don't think we ever define public nuisance, despite it being capitalized, just like right. gathering is never defined, despite it being capitalized. Um, well, gathering, gathering was, I know, was described up above. Oh, it is described. I missed that one up there. Oh, and public nuisance is. Okay, so I missed them. a gathering that constitutes a violation of law or creates a substantial disturbance. Noise, traffic, street, right. urination, fights, disturbances, littering. Um, but, it does, but it doesn't say if you have one transgression, you are a nuisance house, or if you have three transgressions, you are now a nuisance house. 
Yeah, so so the person for first and second response, and it's always associated with a gathering. That's the other thing, yeah. right? Yeah. A house with trash and you know overflowing right. trash with, right. that doesn't that isn't as a result of a party growled or right crowd or event. So to me, nuisance is repeated behavior. You know, anybody. You could go away for a weekend and your God forbid your teenage daughter has a party, but you're not a nuisance house. That's like a one off. <laughs> you know, I think it's the houses that are just, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's where there's that first and second response, and then the third and subsequent, where it's really the third one is what gets the owner in trouble. Um but I, I agree it could be more clear. Um, <laughs> the whole thing. Um, Chris, do you have any thoughts on this as we start looking at this? I know you're more planning and zoning, but. I don't. I really haven't looked at this yet. Um, this is the first time I'm really looking at it with you. Yeah. And I know it's pretty much outside of your purview. It's more of a chief's purview or even Rob. Rob, yeah. When we have Rob. Um, but it sounds like from the three of us that we'd like to take a deeper dive into nuisance, yeah. not just address. Um, the two things that the you know, lawyers some of it you could change right and i've also just because some of it is also activity that could happen in the backyard versus a front yard you know like the beer pong tables if they're in the backyard nobody's but you know it's when they become a staple of the front yard it gets because the back it's because the backyard is full of cars for the too many people that live there <laughs> Okay, so I'll make those notes. That means I'll probably report back to the council that this, I don't know whether we had a, I'd have to look whether our review of this had a deadline, um, but I'll report back to the council that we're going to take a deeper dive and take more time to get back to them. As, so, as a result of the referral, we're not going outside of our referral, but that referral and really looking at it has shown that that enforcement section needs a lot of beefing up and and discussion yeah yep because this, and is, so, this is a real town-wide concern yeah and so we might not i might not get this back on the agenda for a couple months um till after we've finished permitting but we can think about the permitting and that point system when we get to permitting um with respect to there will be you know there is a nuisance bylaw and if we're fixing it like how do those inter relate yeah. Yeah. Um, they need to be they need to be thought of simultaneously simultaneously even if we can't amend simultaneously <laughs> exactly um because i'm not sure we can amend simultaneously in that it'll be too hard i think to work on them together although we might request you know don't deal with rental until we've brought nuisance to okay um with that um, general public comment. I think all the public has left. So we bored we them have much today. Um, I didn't, I don't think they were expecting a discussion on temporary zoning, <laughs> temporary zoning that we were discussing. Chris. I just wanted to let you know, and Janet has left, but, um, we did spend considerable time, Rob Mora, Nate, Malloy and myself meeting with Janet McGowan and Janet Keller. Oh, good. I think it was earlier this week. I can't quite remember. All the days are coming together. But anyway, we did have a very fruitful discussion and we made changes to the document that you saw today that are reflected in what you saw today based on our discussion with them. I thought it was a really good discussion and um, they came in with a lot of concerns. I can't read their minds about how they left, but it seemed like they appreciated the um, meeting. So I just wanted to let you know that. Great. Thank you for that, Chris. And thank you for all your work on this one. Jennifer, before I go on to minutes. Yeah, I just also want to thank Chris because I think people have started to meet with you one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. from the community and they um, find that very helpful. So Good. You, you're, busy, you're very busy, so it's appreciated. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to move to minutes and I'm just going to move to adopt the September 8th, 2022 minute meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> you guys can fight it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any discussion? Uh, what was the date again? September 8th. 
So Jennifer, we start with you. Uh, I. Mandy's an I. Pam. I. They are adopted unanimously. Announcements. So the 24th at 7 p.m., which is Monday, October 24th at 7 p.m., is when our next community forum is going to be. Um, so my plan right now is to. Is that a rental permitting? Rental permitting community forum. Yeah, it's a Monday night. Um, we do have a meeting the 27th. That's when we're going to have all these hearings. Um, but the plan is to to run it similarly to where we ran it last time, but I'm going to have a grid. Um, we're obviously not done with the bylaw, right? It's still a working draft. We haven't discussed half of it. Um, I've been working on converting what is in the current draft now regarding regulations to what regulations would look like, actual language, um, even though we haven't discussed any of it, um, to put out for the community forum so people can see and start a discussion. Um, with clear clarity that none of that has been discussed, right? Um, that it is what we, where things might go. Um, hopefully we'll have a draft fee schedule by then based on the conversations we're gonna have on this coming Monday at the council. Um, we'll have the council discussion on the 17th. I will produce a slightly modified version of the rental registration working draft for all of those discussions, um, the 17th and the 24th, along with that, translation of what's been listed as potential regulations into what the language would look like. So it looks more like a regulation than just a listing of thoughts um, without having deleted anything in there. Um, and then, so I, I'm hoping that, and then I'll produce a sort of compare contrast between the current registered permitting bylaw and what's in the draft. And then I hope to run that forum to sort of section, not quite section by section, but sections of big changes and thoughts on the actual language that we're working on right now um, and the direction it is going, the direction the fee schedule is going based on conversations coming up, um, based on conversations that the council had and all of that. It's not fully formed in my head, but that's sort of the plan where, and we go until everyone is talked out. <laughs> You know? um, so it could be another long night, depending on who shows up, but I really hope that we'll get some feedback on, instead of broad concepts, concepts we've actually put into the bylaw, concepts we've talked about putting into regulations, which is why I've tried to take that point system idea and turn it into some sort of regulation, um, even though we haven't talked about what would accrue points. There's a lot of stuff in there, right? But so that we can get some feedback on those specific concepts. Um, the 27th, I'm going to try and see if it's logical to put the, what we just spent an hour discussing, a little over an hour and a half today, discussing the um, the food and drink establishments onto getting a hearing noticed for the 27th. I'll talk to Chris, you, and Nate about that potential date um, and whether that works and all, or whether we should look at November 3rd, which is our other really close option. Um, that's what else goes on the 13th? I, I haven't talked really about the 13th at all. Um, rental registration will be on the 13th, um, but Pam, you and I need to get together soon to, I'll, I'll send you a draft agenda. ZBA will be on it again. Um, I, at this point, that's all I'm thinking of putting on it. Um, but Pam, you and I should get together since you'll be running that meeting. Yep. Any other thoughts for agendas or announcements or anything? See none. I'm going to thank Chris again. Thank Nate because he popped off before I always remember to thank people, which is at the end after everyone's popped off for the excellent pre presentation um, and, you know, your whole staff's work on getting this so that we don't have to extend the temporary zoning yet another extension that we can just make it make the changes that need to be made to get that benefit that that you guys have liked so much and that has worked well. So um, thank, thank you for you. all your work on that. Um, if there's nothing else, I'm going to adjourn us at 6.34 p.m. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Christine.